Okay, for our next question, we'll begin with Mr. Osnick. There was a recent gang shootout at the fairgrounds. What will you do about increased gang activity in Roseville? There's enough parks, but there are not enough programs. I would like to see Adventure Club be expanded so that it can take more than just young children, but to take those who are on the verge of being adults who have nothing to do. We need to find some way to get youth to be more involved in the community rather than in themselves. Thank you. Ms. Garcia. Thank you. Um, we have the Roseville Rec Center in Roseville, and I think that that really serves our teenage youth well, that provides some programs for them and keeps them off the streets, and they learn about computers and um, gain some technical skills. Um, I think that our community policing program that we have in place also, we have those police then right there in their neighborhoods, they become the friend of the youth, and so they build up a trust. And I think that with the police directly in our neighborhoods, they are guiding the youth and putting, sending them in directions that are in positive ways that can influence them. So those are the two things that I can think of right now that would really benefit the gang problem. But th that was kind of unusual, what happened at the fairgrounds. I don't think that Roseville is known for having gang problems. So. Um, I hope that that is not a regular occurrence in our city. Ms. Gore? We're very fortunate to have a wonderful police department, committed employees who really care about our community. And so I do want to say that I'm very supportive of core services for the city of Roseville. Public safety, of course, uh, being one of them. Um, it's extremely important that we support our public safety, our fire and police. So that's number one. Um, and we also need to look at organizations that do support our youth. So nonprofit groups, organizations like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, of which I'm a volunteer. About a month and a half ago, I sat down with the police chief, uh, chief, chief Hahn, and we talked about different issues that were facing Roseville and where he saw us long term. And this topic actually came up. Uh, it wasn't the gang uh, shooting. It was just, what are we going to do about this demographic? Uh, this younger demographic that's moving into Roseville um, that we're attracting. And if you've been to the Galleria during summer break or during uh, Christmas time or on the weekends, you notice that we are seeing, we are trending from local areas, more young people. Um, and I, I agree with other people up here. That was an isolated incident. We, that is not something that is Roseville. It's not, that's not something we're moving towards. We don't see that very often. But nonetheless, I'd rather be prepared than unprepared. Um, I, one of my platforms and um, that I've mentioned over and over again is working with the nonprofits. They want to be more involved. They haven't been reached out to in the past. You know, they're just looking for a little bit of you know, uh, FaceTime at different events, you know, set up a booth here, a table there. Allow them to reach out and in turn, they will help us with some of these problems like keeping our youth busy, uh, keeping some of the uh, teenagers and, and even people college age who can't seem to stay out of trouble. You know, they will give them things to do. They will keep them occupied, which is what we really want to do. Um, and then, obviously, if, if we need to, you know, increase a police presence if, if needed. But after talking to Chief Hahn, he said that a majority of the uh, crimes that are committed here, especially on the weekends and whatnot, are people that don't live here in the city. They come from other areas. So we have to keep that in mind, too. So maybe we have to address who comes in versus our current uh, population. Ms. Rikuchi? You know, I think that that event that you mentioned is an isolated one. Uh, but the fact of what can happen with gangs or people that are coming in the area, we're working real hard with the police. Uh, you, at our last council meeting, we, we uh, passed an uh, entertainment uh, ordinance. And it, what it does is tighten up um, the activity in our old town so that the police uh, presence are, are there, but we also make sure that uh, the, the people who are working in the, uh, the bars in those areas have more security and if they're not doing right, we have, we have the opportunity to make sure that it's taken care. If we need to make sure there's a dress code, that's gonna happen. We're gonna make sure that when you come into the areas that, um, that people wanna have fun or maybe young people wanna have fun, that it's fun and safe and also well lit. So we're working very hard to make sure that we're gonna take that extra, extra step to uh, ensure safety and, um, and watch out for our community. 
And uh, I think the biggest thing we also have in, is regional cooperation among the police and the, the different um, um, police and the, and the county agencies of working on gang issues and any issues like that. I think our communication is good and they, can, they watch each other. And so if, if one kind of, if a certain type of group comes in, we're all aware and a little bit uh, know the best way to work with, with the community and how we can help. Mr. Alvord? During the Leadership Roosevelt program, I went on uh, police ride-alongs, which I enjoy doing. I used to do that with my dad. And one of the things I was very impressed with is Roseville is not polite to its gang members. The Nortenos, got the North and the South Hispanic gangs here in the area. They know exactly where they live. They're totally identified. They, they know the homes. They know the families. Um, on my ride-along, the very first one I went on, we arrested two gang members. Both of them were... Um, once you go out on parole, you're not allowed to hang out with an, another identified gang member. They were driving along, identified them, spotted them, took them right back to jail, they went back to prison. Yeah, they are really hard on the gang members here. So I think our police are doing a good job. We're also known for the place not to do drug deals. A lot of Sacramento drug dealers will meet people right at the border. They will not step into Roseville because Roseville is not kind to them. One of the neat things that Daniel Hahn has brought to our city, he and Ray Carriage, is the beat process. I know in downtown Roseville, I see cops walking down my sidewalk, coming into my shop, going into the other stores, and they ask questions like, hey, how's it going? Have you guys seen anything we should know about? And I've had my staff members say, you know what? Um, yes, we've had some guys hanging out by the trash cans, and I, I got a lot of women that work in our restaurant, and they get a little nervous about it. You know, we'll do some extra patrols back there. And, and they ask questions like that. They've been coming to the Arcona meetings, to your community neighborhood meetings. This is a wonderful thing. It's community policing. You get to hear about it. They educate us. And we're also, they're encouraging us to call. You see a strange car in the neighborhood, call the cops. And they want to know about that. That's how they stop the break-ins. And so getting the community involved, this is going to get very critical, especially during the prison release that's going on. Okay, for our next question, we'll begin with Ms. Garcia. In light of inevitable energy depletion and need for local self-sufficiency, what will you require of developers who apply to build here? Well, I think that there are a number of programs um, that are, I mean, with the energy, can you re repeat the question again? I'm sure. sorry. In light of inevitable energy depletion and need for local right. self-sufficiency, what will you require of developers who apply to build here? Okay, well, I think that there is um, already some mandates in place that are state-driven regarding the traffic and, um, I don't know, we've talked about the roundabouts that are um, proposed in town because that um, reduces your carbon footprint. And then also, I think that there are some other mandates as far as um, the building with the federal and state mandates that, um, that are through the environmental process in that they have to um, meet certain regulations in order to, before, that they, before they can build. I'm not really sure of the details of all of them, but I think that that is probably the best answer that I can give for that. Thank you. Ms. Gore? I think uh, the city does a very good job when it comes to planning growth. Over the years, they've had the specific plans. And the specific plans have really laid out what a certain area is going to look like. So what buildings, what schools, what residents, uh, roads, uh, health care, all sorts of different things that will take place in that large portion of land. And it goes through the, a very large, very detailed process of making sure that um, when development occurs, um, all the I's are dotted and the T's are, are crossed so that it's a, it's a fiscally sound project. Uh, the one thing I appreciate, the, appreciate about the city is the city makes those developers do a lot of hard work before they get approved. Um, and ultimately, it comes down to making sure that any development that we have in the future um, pays for itself, that it's fiscally responsible. We can't go ahead and, and develop land if it's going to cost the city a lot of money. We can't develop projects if ultimately it's going to hurt um, this, the current services that we have for our, our current residents. So we don't want to have development affect our local residents and our water supply or um, our parks or our police officers. We want to make sure that any type of development is really fiscally responsible for our community. Mr. Mendonca? 
First, I, I want to make sure that we have the appropriate checks and balances in place between the city and the developers. I think that the, the very first line of defense we have to have is a clear line of communication. Uh, we don't want to see um, decisions being made and, oh, we didn't think of that or we should have thought of that or we need to make sure we have a clear plan. We need to look at what we have available. I mean, part of the question was, you know, depletion of resources and, you know, with us having our own electric company and, and Placer County Water, and, you know, we have a lot of, of, of local players here, so we need to make sure that we're looking at this as a long-term investment. We might have it now, but um, this actually was another question that came up in another debate yesterday. We talked a little bit about it. Um, with water and whatnot, um, we need to be looking not just two years from now, 20 years from now. Is this going to be a development that's going to be here for a while? And is this development going to reinvest in the city in a positive way? This is not something that we want to detract. We don't want to put something there that might be popular now, it might be something that's trendy now, like a, um, you know, something you would see in, in another area of the state that is trendy but might not fit so well here. It has to also complement what's existing. Um, because just because it's nice and new and shiny doesn't necessarily mean it's going to help you, your values, or the community. Uh, we need to make sure it's complementary, make sure that it's not going to be a drain on our existing resources, and that we actually look that we have enough that we can actually support this project. And then making a, a loop back to that circle, I definitely want to make sure that uh, our city planners and, and, and our city resources are involved in the uh, decision-making processes uh, very clearly with these developers to make sure there's no uh, you know, loose ends that we don't see. Ms. Rakuchi? I think one of the biggest things that we've done here at the City of Roseau is make sure that we're self-contained, and that's why we built the Roseau Energy Park. And the reason for that is a lot of expenses is the transmission line to get the electricity to Roseau. It's like having a car, but the cost is getting your car on the highway and going someplace. And here we don't have to go someplace, it's here. So that makes a big difference in your cost. All the latest new specific plans that we have, we've incorporated these new ideas that, um, that are you know, energy efficient. So you'll have things like, we've had, we had solar rooftop, rooftops before it became mandatory. I mean, it was something that we were looking into. This, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't the state of California's idea, it was the fact that we thought it was, made sense. Economic sense for the community and, it, and, it, and was another alternative source of, uh, of electricity. Also, if you look at some of the new homes, if you go to them, they have things like, you know, the instant hot water. They have all the newest things that they have. And these are becoming literally commonplace because if you make your house energy efficient, it, it, it's, better for the, it's better for their consumer. And the, because it's being done at a, at a larger scale, the price is going down. So that's what we're doing. When we have specific plans, it's almost, it's not, I'm going to say almost mandatory. It is mandatory. That's, it's becoming a common thing that we do. I mean, we don't even think, make second that you wouldn't do this. And actually, most of our developers feel that way, too, because that's part of, of building new homes. Mr. Alvord? The county is giving us um, quite a bit of land. It's actually going to allow for 50 years of continued growth. Now, I live right down the street here, and like many residents out on this side of Roseville, it kind of freaks me out thinking about um, the, the population doubling in Roseville, the traffic on the street. That's a very big concern and possibly get into air pollution you know, issues. So we, we need to make sure a couple things. One thing that we're doing that's really nice, it's a, a technique called sustainable communities. And Roseville's doing this. As they build out west, they try to design a community so that there's all the amenities you need, basic amenities, right there in your neighborhood. There's some you know, grocery, a gas station, um, you know, things that you need right there. So it's very little driving across town to get something. Yes, you still drive across town and maybe you know you hit your favorite restaurant or something, but you don't have near the traffic just driving around because they build the amenities right in the communities. And they're very green in the way they're building them out now. It's a lot of state mandates. But this is a really nice concept in a growing city. And something that is nice about growing is in the process of growing, that tax revenue that's coming back is going to help us really work on infrastructure, make sure we've got enough water, keep our power plant adequate to handle that growth. We are very, very blessed in Roseville to have that kind of uh, an ability to grow because it's really going to help solve a lot of our quality of life problems. Even though it sounds like it's scary, it's actually a huge advantage for us. Mr. Osnick? I believe in the year 2040, the city of Roseville will be about 154,000 people. The specific plans that I was part of on the city council, putting things together to make things come together 
quickly without a lot of traveling, putting in those malls only where they're necessary. That's the things that will help. Also, there's a thing called I'm sorry, it's, it's something about uh, getting the houses so that they're free of uh, loss of heat. Thank you. <laughs>